Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here, John. I actually, um, during the film festival, we showed uh, the biggest little farm, and um, he he promised that he would come back uh, to do a Q and A um, at the Riviera Theater. And you're a man of your word, and I appreciate that immensely. Um, you, one of the remarkable things about this film is that um, we learn a lesson that that if we play, we pay close attention to and understand the interconnect connectedness of things, um, we, we, we can lead a better life. When did you understand the process of the filming and being a farmer, of that, the in, internet, interconnectedness of things? Well, the, um, first of all, thank you so much for showing up. This is crazy. I, I came up to the front and I said, I said, uh, how's it going? She said, it's sold out, you can't get in there. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wow, that is fantastic. And the, lady, and the nice woman was like, why is, why is that fantastic? And I said, I, it's a good thing also, for me. And you also, <laughs> I was telling him you missed that there were 40 angry people uh, that yes. were turned away. I'm really sorry and happy to hear that. <laughs> um, so I, I think it was, uh, I, I never really intended to make the film. Um, I, I didn't think there was a, First of all, I didn't want it to be a story about my wife and I floundering around, you know, fish out of water, and th that had been made, and I really didn't, I wasn't interested in the, in, in the film business anymore. I was really happy to like try to do this thing, but I didn't understand how it all would even fit together. Like, what would the story be? And if I started saying I was gonna make this movie, then like I would have to kind of force some happy ending that didn't exist. And, but I did have this thing where I couldn't help myself when I would see something that was inspiring to me that I thought might be a player, like a keystone player. You know, they talk about that. Animals, there's various uh, animals that are keystone players in our ecosystem, like a starfish or a sea otter, or a hummingbird. And when these things go away, um, ecosystems fail. So um, I, 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 in a, at year five, I saw the return of all this biodiversity, and I realized what I had been doing is capturing the microcosms, the microcosm form of the keystone players of our farm, that were actually balancing the farm against these epidemics of pests and disease that we had been facing for the years prior. And then it just flooded over me in an, in an instant that I was in the midst of, or in the middle of, uh, the engine of an ecosystem being reawakened and in the engine 24 seven for up to that point, five years of the story. And I'm like, who is ever going to do that? <laughs> like what filmmaker would ever just shoot a hole in the bottom of his career and walk away from that and spend that time. And I'm like, this is definitely a unique story and I, and I need to share what I'm seeing. But, so, but you, uh, year five is when I decided that I was going to call the footage and then really double down and, and then the remaining three years really seriously and cinematically acquire all the missing elements while shooting just the day in life of stuff. But you mentioned that you never intended it for it to be a film, but you were documenting yeah. from the get go. What was, what, what was, what was the purpose of documenting yeah. from the get go? Yeah, I know that's weird. I don't, uh, the, some of it was, I was making, I was making these little short films I made like f four or five of them for uh, an Oprah series about animal characters on the farm, but they weren't ants and they weren't hawks and things like that. And they were really, they were three minute pieces and they're very easy to make, you know. But I, I was suspicious that there was things about like ants and aphids. Like we spent years shooting the ants and aphids and there's a three second shot, it's actually two and a half, of the honeydew coming out the backside of an aphid. Did anyone see that? I mean, that whole, that, we don't even explain it, but that, ex that entire, that story of Aunt David set up the entire understanding for me and framed how the entire farm works. So that ant is guarding and protecting that aphid from ladybugs. Many of you gardeners know this. And the exchange for that, the payment to the mob, the ant, is this honeydew that's extracted through sucking the nectar from the, the plant. You know, the aphid's sort of siphoning that out. And then in that, if we're exchange for that nectar, it protects it against attacks from things like uh, ladybugs. But once the population of ladybugs got to such a degree, it was able to overpower the ant population. And that happened at year five. And we stopped hearing about our garden team and our orchard team being concerned about things like aphids. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so anyway, it was when I was capturing those things that I realized there was more to the story. Um, speaking of pivotal, pivotal moments, there there is a moment in the story where we start understanding that the weeds that we think are damaging things are actually the problems that you're encountering are actually the solutions. It, it, you know, can you tell us about the, the, those discoveries? Yeah. So, like, I mean, like, weeds are uh, indicators. They're 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 trying to repair terrestrial landscapes from, you know, the decimation of pulling all cover crop off of it, whether we consider it a weed because it's an unfavorable plant that we just don't like for some reason, or it's invasive and takes over. But the, they're indicators of what the soil needs. And if we let those systems sort of do their own thing, it may take hundreds or thousands of years to rebuild. But we can advance that with our human force of nature and understanding what that soil needs and plant cover crops that actually speed that process along of rebuilding soil and restoring diverse microorganism ecology back into the land. So it's funny, because at first I was like, oh my god, this place has tons of weeds. And then I realized, oh wow, purslane uh, an acre of purslane is 400 pounds of potassium. <laughs> and also, I can sell it at Erwan because people will buy it and eat it. You know? But other farmers are spraying it and killing it. Um, so you start to completely look differently at, at all those things. You know? um, but you know, but, 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 you know, the part of the point that I wanted to address is that you t you know, I'm, we, we have talked the fact that I'm not an uh, I'm not a nature lover. I'm not an outdoor person. Sorry, I'm a film lover. I love being inside in the dark. But you, watching, watching your film, you've, you've taught me about embracing conflicts, and specifically embracing nature's conflicts and, and, and addressing them head on. And it, I find that so inspiring. And when did, in your journey as a filmmaker and as a farmer, did you understand that? Um. Well, that was the stuff that Alan always talked about. It was definitely the mission of what Molly and I hoped we could we could do is sort of live in coexistence with nature. But the moment I shot the coyote, I realized I had just completely given up on that. And um, there were so many other problems where I, I would look at Molly and we would have these great arguments at night where neither of us knew what the what what, what the right answer was, which resulted in a fantastic couples therapist around year three. <laughs> In case you were wondering how my wife and I did that, <laughs> that's how. Um, so um, I, I, I think what I think to me, what's important to remember is that throughout the whole entire thing, most of what we were feeling was embarrassment and failure. And in that, when we overcorrected, and f to get out of the feeling of embarrassment. And then, because embarrassment then leads to like fear and anger and resentment amongst your team or your spouse. And the embarrassment moment was the thing where there was the real opportunity to sit in and try to break down the anatomy of the crime and understand what was the purpose of the thing that you were seeing as an adversary um, or you know the, the the enemy, and then what were the predators that exist within you know the the laws of biomimicry that can balance those things out? But the problem is, is that I think we've all been taught that if you have a problem, there's a solution, and that's not the way the ecosystem works. And there's also no such thing as right and wrong. <laughs> it's all based on consequences. You can justify right and wrong all day long, but the consequences are the only real thing. And so you you learn very quickly that there's a whole other language of complexity. Um, and, and I think what that is, though, is very humbling because you also realize that there's not a simple solution to this stuff. And that actually takes away all this responsibility and this anger and this like resentment that comes from that failure and the embarrassment. Yeah, amazing. Um, so you're... You're working as a farmer, which is a challenge enough, and then at the same time you're making this film, and all along it's an eight-year uh, process. How how difficult or challenging, or was it fun to be challenging making a film and you know building the farm at the same time? Um, so, uh, like I said, around year three and four, I thought we were. I mean, I really did think that I didn't know if we were going to make it. Um, Molly will say differently. She's like a hummingbird high on nectar that I can't figure out where she gets it from. She just, her answer is like, well, I think we should just go big, or go bigger. I think that's the answer. And I'm like, 
the hell's wrong with you? Like, I, I'm always like, I wanted to believe Santa was real, but I also didn't want to, like, find out one day he wasn't. So I have a more, I think that's a more masculine role where, like, yes, I want to believe in fairy tales, but I'm not going to be fooled when they're not real. And I, and I, I sort of played that role. But I, I, um, I completely forgot the question. No. <laughs> About how hard, how, how were you able to balance, oh, balance filming and at the same time being oh. a farmer? So, okay, so, um, well, again, so we, we amassed 90 terabytes of footage. That's a lot of footage. And, uh, but we did it incrementally over the period of eight years. So we would, I, I, there were interns on the farm for the first five years that just, they all know how to work Final Cut Pro now, even if they're like business majors. And so I had these interns who were really interested, as two of them, and uh, actually a couple more than that, and they were shooting stuff on iPhones, on C300s, if you geek out on this stuff. Eventually, we got the Amira. We had F55, you know, 4K cameras eventually. But they were just sort of like amassing this footage, so it didn't feel like a lot of stress at that point. But around year five, when I made a serious commitment to do it, I did think that like it was really difficult because I would be in the editing room, there would be an, a, a veterinary emergency, I'd have to go out and deal with that, I'd come back covered in fluids, a fire was breaking out, then we have to unplug our drives and like evacuate the drives while I'm also moving animals. And that's when I was like, oh, my childhood set me up for this because I lived in a really chaotic household and the way I dealt with it was like denial and complete numbness. <laughs> And I was getting, I was okay, but I was watching people around me fall apart. And I realized that's an unhealthy thing. So I won't put my crew or my family through it again, but it was very difficult in that last three years. So you were filming and editing at the same time, and was there, and you're basically telling me that there was no room for processing what was actually happening. That's what our couple's therapist was for. <laughs> you know, I, I think, um, one thing I would say is strange, that it's a really good point. Like we spend a lot, Molly talk about this a lot. We, we spend a lot of time like f really sort of like not knowing how to deal with a problem. And the first thing we try to do is say, all right, I'm really scared. And I, and I think what that actually does is actually does the same thing that like a flower does to a bee. It actually draws like support to you. And so the, the, the more like, honest we've been able to make ourselves and our crew with those moments, the more we've actually come together as a team to solve, to solve problems, to be in the middle of what was really a very chaotic eight years, and especially this last, those last three. Um, so you started the movie with uh, fires, and now fires have become the new normal in our environment, especially here in, in California. How, how are you dealing as, as a farmer with, with the fires? Well, I mean, we've been really fortunate. There's probably people in this room who've lost homes, you know, and I, I, we've been very fortunate. But you know, you don't when there's those big fires, you don't hear about all the small fires that are breaking out, as you some of you might know. Like it's like a war zone, right? You know, like there was three fires on the perimeter of our property. No one heard about those while the Thomas fire was going on. Or um, we've been lucky so far because the wind, as you all know, this is great talking to this audience when. It just hasn't come from north northeast. Once that fire comes from north northeast, where the Santa Ana's come from, then we're going to be like everyone else. I understand them a little bit better. We all do, and you know, I don't. Uh, we we irrigate stuff, so we're a little we're a little insulated. But a blowtorch can burn through anything with enough time. Um, so I wouldn't say that we're like. F f foolproof on it, but we know where to move at the animals now. We kind of have a drill because we've been through it so many times. And I, I don't know. In the grand scheme of things, I don't know if this is the new normal. I don't know if I... I think things are cyclical. I'm not saying that they're not man-made. These aren't uh, man-made issues that have forced a rebalance of the, the, e the, the planetary ecosystem, which is the immune system, right? We're watching immuno immunological responses. That's what an ecosystem is. It's doing everything as a consequence to many other things that happened before, maybe even before our time. Um, but we have the power to maybe even have a hand in reversing it. Um, but I don't know if this is the new normal or not. I, I'd like to think it's not. Um, and you know, when, what, and what is it like working under an ecosystem that is constantly under assault of climate change? Well, I heard that nor true north is changing. Magnetic north is changing. 
if you live long enough, biology is ch constantly changing. Um, I think that it's funny that we talk about what is the economic sustainability of regenerative farming. And I got to say, that's kind of the ideology of cancer. It figures out how to live forever without ever acknowledging that it's draining a host that ultimately, if it's not stopped, will kill. And with it, cancer dies too. And I think that we've gotten here, you know, the, they say, there's this really cool analogy, if I could for a second. Like, you ever heard that taking the 4.5 billion years that the Earth's been around, and you compress it to a calendar year? So, uh, Homo sapiens didn't show up in the, in the history of Earth until like the last 20 or so minutes on December 31st. <laughs> and then agriculture, I guess, from what I've read, is, was started, say, where we're ripping into the land, actually, oh, we can grow stuff if we force something to grow here in the last so minute or so. But the Industrial Revolution, where we mechanize things, didn't happen until the last two seconds on December 31st. And in that time, we've destroyed one third of our topsoils. We've deforested 46% of our trees. And for the sake of argument, something happened where the CO2 levels in our atmosphere doubled from 260 to over 400 parts per million in two seconds. But we did that unconsciously, just like cancer. But we're not cancer, we're conscious. And I think that when we're conscious, our force of nature has a far more superior and, and can expedite the return and the rebuilding of something. Because let me give you another example. You had two people from the city who knew nothing about this stuff. We had a farm that had been farmed 45 years through extractive methods to grow cheap food, destroyed the soils, and we came in with consciousness and the help of some investors but we returned it to better than what it was in seven years. I think there's incredible hope in the human force of nature when it's conscious. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I greatly admire about the film and about you and Molly, that you seem to find inspiration and energy uh, despite challenges and struggles. Where do you think that, that in, inspiration and energy was coming from? Um, I, I don't know. I taught uh, my, our son's four. I, I don't know. I, I've always been, and same with Molly, there is a degree of tenacious tenaciousness in, in us, and um, I think reverence. But you know, in documentary filmmaking, I don't know, maybe it was this, like I've, in documentary filmmaking, you get to go into these different worlds. And you realize that, I mean, my job as a storyteller was always to humanize these people that were bigger than, like, just bigger than life. And in that process of humanizing them, I realized that they were, you know, they were they were human, and, and that they didn't always know perfectly all the answers. And in some way, I think that's shown me that, that there's a lot of room for just courage in, 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 in being, like, like in being audacious enough to think that you might actually be able to do something um, that you have no right thinking you can do. Maybe that's crazy. I don't know. <laughs> and there's a fine line. <laughs> what was the most surprising thing that happened um, while you were filming? I can't. I'm sorry. I can't think of it. It's all so incredible. Uh, I'll try to. Can we come back to that? I'll try to give that some real thought. Are you going to wait? No, oh. no, 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 no. I can move on to the next question. You know, you know, and, and, and you know, what, what, what are the happiest things for you, you know, being a farmer? Not, as a, not a filmmaker, but what are the happy things that you, that you find being a farmer? Oh, my God, I stumped no, you. Should no, I, I think, go back? To you know, it's really funny. The reason, one of the reasons I made the film, and this is, a, I think, another hopeful thing, is that I have a, you know, it wasn't a polarizing story. I, it was intentional not to make it about climate change. And I think that stuff, I mean, Inconvenient Truth, one of the executive producers of the film is Laurie David. She produced Inconvenient Truth. I don't think that stuff works. I, I don't think scaring the hell out of people changes anything. I think it 
narrows our perspective. It doesn't allow us to be more open and see more. We get really angry at one side. The other side gets more re sort of closed off. And it, it, the polarization destroys the innovation that communication pathways are dependent upon. Um, I know, that's... I and, really and, and, and <laughs> but, you know, the biggest little farm, this film that you made with Molly, is because it's now a blueprint for better living and for us uh, taking care of uh, our planet. Was, was that something that all along you were hoping for? To yeah, and let me just say that there's farmers that are far more experienced than Molly and I doing this and have been doing it for longer. And there's farmers that started in the late 60s, even 70s, with this idea of what organic now has become. And we have borrowed from all of those guys. You know, what, you know, I know I'm a better storyteller than most farmers because that's what I did for 25 years, 30 years. But, you know, there are so many other people that are greater teachers than us. What I think we showed was a version of the way. I think it's unique to our farm on our piece of land with our circumstances and our partnership with our investor, you know, and that changes. But what it is a model for is that the, the, the more beautifully complex and diverse an ecosystem is, the, 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 more, the more possibilities there are to collaborate with it. And, you know, um, yeah. So I, you, you taught me while watching your film about perseverance. So I'm going back to my question. What was the most surprising thing that happened while you were filming? Does someone want to take a guess? I don't know. Um, I, 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 while filming, I think just the, 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 like, okay, first of all, when we put those wildlife cameras out there, I didn't look at that footage for six months. We just kept amassing it. And then we watched and we're like, oh my God, what are <laughs> all these things are out there? Like, oh, we didn't know we had bobcats. And oh, oh, we didn't, I, did, I had never seen a badger before. <laughs> Badgers are that, that little thing with the limp. All right, they're the meanest sons of, you don't want to <laughs> mess with those things. Like, I'm more scared of badgers and rattlesnakes and mountain lions combined. But they tunnel under the ground and eat gophers from the bottom. I like, they're vicious. Like, and the, we have a lot of badgers. And when I see those holes, I'm always like, okay, like make sure my son stays away from those things. But like, I think that, and also I didn't know I had, like we counted, I, we, we estimate there's probably like 15 coyotes on the property still. And, and I didn't know that. And there was a time where I was like, do I have to still kill coyotes? Cause I killed that one. And, and I'm like, I can't just kill 15 coyotes. Like how, that just doesn't make sense. But then on the flip side, this is the interesting thing. And I know I'm getting away from your question again, but, it's not intentional, but I, but I, but I, so we killed 300, we watched 350 chickens die. And I had to, f we had to face our, you know, our intern and our team being like, well, how can you let 350 chickens die? Cause you want to coexist with nature, you know? And so it, it's all about lesser two evils. And like you, this stuff is very complicated. And I don't know if I made the right, I feel good about where it landed, but I couldn't have told you then and there that that was the decision that was going to make sense. And so that's why I say I don't want to come from on high with this. Like, we don't have it all figured out. There's still a lot of problems. I just think I'm more comfortable with the fact that this is just what it is. And you have to be accepting of this comfortable level of disharmony, you know? And there's coyotes in all of our lives. And we have to find their role or get rid of them, you know? But there is potentially something incredibly valuable about that. And I think the, getting to the point, all right, the most surprising thing to me was... Um, like how much I think Molly and I both learned about uh, life and, and the impermanence of life teaching us so much about what life really is. It was so profound to me and I think that was the most surprising thing to come out of all of this. I didn't expect to have this, to have this opportunity to talk in front of people about it and to be talking about it like on from, from, the, from the perspective of the human condition. I didn't think I had anything to say, but that's what I think has been gifted to me by this experience. Well, and, and we're so lucky for, for this gift you've given us. It's a remarkable film. It's one of the best films 
it, and thank you. Thank you so much for being here <laughs> thank you. tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Spread the word about the film. Yeah. Please.